So here we go. So our first guest speaker today is uh, Deanna Adams, who is a board member of Houston Black Nonbelievers, a local organization created to support African American free thinkers in the greater Houston area. She's also the author of the blog Musings on a Limb, an uh, excellent blog where she ex expresses her views as an African American atheist professional mom on subjects related to the intersectionality of racism and skepticism. So please welcome our first guest speaker today, Deanna Adams. from the building to this van, uh, some of them in handcuffs. And what I found out that was later was uh, truant students, or students who had been truant. They couldn't have been truant that day because they picked them up from school. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we had a lot of that in Texas, and, you know, students were taken to criminal court, their parents were fined, um, there was just this whole cycle that was going on. And I just always thought it was very weird to pick them up at school for not going to school. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing that happened was a couple years later when I was teaching world geography, I had a student come in. I was eight months pregnant at the time, a little hormonal. And um, I had a student that was tardy for first year. So I was sitting down, he walked in the door, and I said, you need to go you know, get your tardy slip. And that's all I said. And he's like, F U B, and you guys can imagine <laughs> what that was there in the room. And I, I got angry. This is not one of my shining moments as a teacher. Let me tell you that I walked down the hall with this student, followed him to the AP's office, and demanded that the AP do something about it. I was given the opportunity to write an affidavit so that he could be ticketed for cursing in the school building, and I filled out that application. Uh, or that affidavit. So I do believe he was ticketed. I didn't hear more about it after that. Uh, like I said, not my most shining moment. When, now that I look back on it, I do regret that decision. I did find out later that the night before, the day before, this child's father had been sentenced to 35 years in prison. <clears throat> and his mother, in her uh, despair, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, decided that it would be best for him to go to school to try to return to a sense of normalcy. And I just happened to be the 
first person who said something to him. So, looking back on it, I do wish that I had kind of dug a little deeper before I just demanded, you know, how dare you call me this name. So with all that being said, um, let's talk about the school to prison pipeline. I promise I will try not to read bullet points to you. <laughs> I said I'll try, um, but there's a lot of information on this subject, and I definitely suggest that you go back and you, um, you know, do some research. I'll provide some links at the end. So, what is the school to prison pipeline? And we're going to try to. I'm not quite sure how to do it. Just so I'll just do that. Oh, okay. So what is the school to prison pipeline? Basically the ACLU defines it as a disturbing national trend whereas students are funneled out of public schools and into the juvenile justice system. That's you know, the basic definition. There's also emergent research on the sexual abuse to prison pipeline as well where girls are basically punished sometimes for being victims of childhood sexual abuse or sometimes as an after effect of it. For example, if a girl is um, abused and she hurts her abuser or she assaults her abuser, a lot of times she is arrested then for the assault, but nothing is done about the sexual abuse that caused it. So we are seeing that as well, and there are people who are uh, looking into that. There are three main causes that have been decided on collectively. Again, there are tons of causes for this. But the three main causes that people look at are the zero tolerance policies, which we'll talk a lot about, increased reliance on law enforcement and criminal courts for students, and also hostile school climates. That is um, a definition from Texas Appleseed, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works for justice for underrepresented Texans. Texans, excellent group, look them up. And also, again, emergent research is quantifying something that we've known for a very long time, but the notion that black children are seen as older, less innocent, more culpable, and because of those perceptions are disciplined more harshly than their white peers. So, zero tolerance policies. If we go way back to 1973, the Safe and Clean Neighborhoods Act of New Jersey kind of was the start of this new way of policing, whereas the point was to have foot, for this particular act, was to have foot patrols going through the neighborhood so that the police were more visible, and then also for kind of nipping crime in the bud as they saw it, which meant having, you know, um, police ticket people or arrest people for such things as breaking windows, uh, petty crime, smaller crimes were being dealt with swiftly in an effort to say, well, if we deal with these small things now, then these kids won't grow up to become, and adults too, won't grow up to become murderers. So, you know, don't break a window now when you're 14, because we don't want you to become a murderer, you know, later. So that kind of started this ball rolling. And then in 1994, the zero tolerance in schools, those policies became widespread in the U.S. when uh, the Gun Free Schools Act passed, and that was a Clinton um, Act, a Clinton era act that required states to expel for one year any student who was convicted of bringing a firearm to school. A firearm. It started as a gun-free schools act for bringing firearms. What happened after that is zero tolerance just exploded to things such as uh, disruption of class, um, talking back to the teacher, calling your teacher curse words, and you know, truancy, and it, it became it kind of just snowballed after that. So, and also it's definitely important to note that there is no credible evidence that these policies have changed crime at all. Any difference is negligible, and there's also studies that show there's other reasons why crime has actually decreased since uh, the mid-90s. The increased use of police forces on campus, um, 
basically between 2001 and 2006, Texas schools increased their policing in their school districts by 30% or more. So you have more police on campus. You have campuses with all sorts of weapons, some military grade, um, dogs, uh, what is it, bomb sniffing dogs or drug sniffing dogs that twice a year in some schools, middle schools and high schools will go and just, you know, try to see what they can find. Um, students arrested on campus. Here in Texas, truancy became a Class C misdemeanor in 1995. And prior to 2015, Texas and Wyoming were the only two states that actually criminally prosecuted students and their parents for truancy. And a lot of these arrests, especially in the 1990s and 2000s when they exploded, they disproportionately affected African American students and students with disabilities. So a lot of times, especially with students with disabilities, schools would criminalize them and penalize them instead of giving them the services that they needed and in an effort to not have to give them the services that they needed because if they weren't at the school they didn't have to provide the services <coughs> and also hostile school climates so this goes right along with the policing on campus and things like that increases in the class C misdemeanors physical police presence um, as we've already stated students of color and students with disabilities disproportionately ticketed and arrested. And even as late as 2010, 2011, elementary age students had been ticketed and arrested in Texas. And when I say elementary age students, I mean nine year olds, 10 year olds, 11 year olds getting tickets. So, for what? For a disruption of class, for a truancy, for all sorts of different behaviors. Uh, plus, if they were misbehaving on the bus, they would be able, they would get a ticket as well sometimes. So the question, we, it, this begs the question, is this necessary? Does it work? You know, our schools were getting so bad. We were so afraid. Teachers were just getting murdered by the dozens. Was that really happening? A 2007 FBI study actually found very low levels of crime in schools nationally. And that's in 2007. Um, students arrested at school most commonly use their hands, fists, or feet. So we're not seeing a lot of guns on campus. I believe it's 3% guns, 8% knives. Um, again, African American students make up about 25% of those students, or students, or, sorry, of the reported arrests. However, the majority of school crime reports involve 13 to 15 year old white males. And finally, about the teachers, and they're so scared. Um, the poll of teachers, and I, and I was one, and I was scared, so I can make that joke. Poll of teachers showed very little difference between the rate of assaults on teachers in 1956 and 2003-2004. So, there is a perception, yes, and I was one of those teachers that this is just getting bad, this is out of hand, but if we look at the raw numbers, there really wasn't much difference, okay? So, here's another infographic. I'm pretty sure you can't see this. I thought maybe it would be bigger, sorry. But the, the main point is that, basically, as I've said before, 31%, um, I'm going to have to look really quickly, because that, um, that one jumped out at me. Black students comprise 31% of those arrested in schools nationally. And this is an infographic pulled out by the ACLU, so you can definitely go take a look at that as well. And black students were also three times more likely to be arrested or ticketed on campus. Well, if 31% are black students, <coughs> what percentage of the student population do they comprise? That's a very good question that I have two slides from now, but it's about 9% <laughs> in certain areas. Yeah, and actually here, and you really can't see it, it's 9% um, nationally, but the, uh, I believe the 31% or 25% is the arrest. So, and I'll show that on more of a local level as well with Houston ISD and Dallas ISD. So, thank you for your question. It leads right on into the actual data. What's going on or what has been going on here in Texas. And um, this is a large district citation and arrest rates for 2010, 2011. This was put out by Texas Appleseed. Again, they have a report with listing over 40 school districts in Texas their arrest rates, their citation rates, and some of the districts were able to break it down by age and demographics, some weren't. So it's a, a lot of really good information out there and I just pulled out some of it to um, show. 
Cypher and Fort Worth were highlighted here because they were using local law enforcement at this time. Cypher does have their own police department now, as do a lot of um, districts in Texas. And as you can see here, just the, you know, a couple things. Cypher citation rate was 29.5, and that's per thousand students. And the arrest rate was 7.4 per thousand students. And uh, let's look at Dallas and Fort Worth a little closer. So Houston ISD, I'm sorry, Dallas and Houston. Houston ISD, really quickly here, the student body, 26% African American, but as you can see, the tickets issued, 45% African American. The, um, let's see, the Hispanic population in Houston ISD, 62%, 54%, uh, I'm sorry, that's white. Oh, not there. Hispanic population looks like something different. No, the red is actually white. This one switched on me. It's just a white inclusive Hispanic. Oh, thank you. So because HISD didn't, see this is what happens when you have 5,000 signs. Because HISD didn't separate white and Hispanic for their uh, citations and their tickets, they're included in the red. So thank you. Um, by age, this is Houston ISD citations in the year 2010-2011. The majority of the students, 40%, were 14 and 15 year olds. Now, many of you probably have had 14 or 15 year olds. If not, you have been a 14 or 15 year old. That is a stage of just a lot going on. There's hormonal changes, there are psychological changes. You're going from middle school to high school. So you're, you know, kind of going from that childhood to adolescence or farther into the adolescence. There should be a lot of support there, a lot of support, psychological support, educational support, things of that nature. Not a lot of tickets and arrests and citations. And then what else is very disturbing, I mean this whole chart is disturbing, but another thing is this is 9 to 11 year olds. 3% of all the citations issued in HISD in 2010-2011 were to 9 to 11 year olds. They can't write contracts, so why are they getting tickets? They can't read the tickets half the time. Hey, Deanna? Yes. What is the citation or a ticket? What does that do to the kid or the family? Well, Prior to this year, and, and there's actually been some laws changing that, but basically it could be anything from a, a fine for the child, for the parent, most likely it's, you know, for the parent, especially with 9 to 11 year olds, um, and things like that. Usually it's a fine, and they could be upwards of $500. But is it a record that's kept in a file so that yeah. when they're 23, there is this little data that they were a arrested or cited? There's a juvenile record and depending on the child it may be expunged when they turn 18, it may not. A lot of these students don't have proper um, proper representation so even though they say the records are expunged if they don't have a lawyer who's going to make sure that that happens it may stay on the records and nowadays even if things are expunged there's records of everything everywhere so if someone looks hard enough, they can find it, definitely. Um, and so again, Dallas ISD, now in Houston ISD, I use the citation rate. This is the Dallas ISD arrest rate, so you can see that they're you know, basically about the same. Again, 25% African American population, 46% of those arrested were African American. Um, in this one, we actually do have a breakout between white and Hispanic, so 68% Hispanic population. 43% arrest, and 5% white population, 10% arrest. And then also by age, again, there are 10 to 12 year olds being arrested. Well, there were in 2010, 10 to 12 year olds being arrested in Dallas ISD. 14% of those arrests were 10 to 12 year olds. 45% of those arrests were 13 to 15 year olds, and then 40% were 16 to 18. So again, just to, to reiterate, a Texas Appleseed had this infographic in March of this year 
approximately 115,000 failure to attend school cases were filed against Texas students in 2013. That's truancy cases, and those were criminal cases. That is more than double the amount in the rest of the nation, over double. Um, we've talked about this hurt, these laws hurt students and these laws hurt families. Okay, 80 percent of those students are low income, so you add another fine on top of it, and then they can't pay the fine, and so it gets bigger and bigger, and you can see where the snowball is going to go from there. So, with all of that information, I believe we can agree that there's a problem, right? Let's see what, what's been going on to hopefully dismantle this, because there is a little bit of good news. More people are talking about it, and some things are changing, that we do need to keep talking about it and get more changes going. So nationally speaking, um, there have been many research articles, people talking about it, to show the detrimental effects of these policies, the school to prison pipeline as a whole, but also zero tolerance policies, police and schools, things like that, and also the disproportionality of the punishments. Uh, data showing the lack of benefit is also being talked about by higher level officials. So um, Attorney General Holder in 2013 spoke about it, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out against it, and also the American Psychological Association. Many states and districts are finally moving away from zero tolerance policies, so that's definitely a good sign. And there's a lot of uh, code of conduct reviews in school districts and retraining of school resource officers, which is kind of the next frontier of that as well. Again, nationally in 2011, the U.S. Department of Justice and U.S. Department of Ed created the Supportive School District Initiative, I'm sorry, Supportive School Discipline Initiative, which basically seeks to coordinate and kind of support districts in making these changes. Uh, President Obama in 2014 launched My Brother's Keeper to help boys and men of color excel and uh, ensure that they can reach their full potential and also address persistent opportunity gaps. And also he uh, did a report, or the White House report, on women and girls of color to address the challenges and expand opportunities for them as well because we can't leave girls out of the equation, especially young black girls who are, again, more times likely to be punished severely, to even be perceived as, you know, sassy or loud mouth or talking back or rude or what have you, perception becomes reality. That's the perception and then these girls are punished more harshly. So we're definitely speaking out about that too. Locally here in Texas, again Texas Appleseed, these are just some of the things that they've been able to, to help with. In 2009 they succeeded in helping pass new state laws to eliminate expulsions from disciplinary, disciplinary alternative schools for persistent minor misbehavior and require schools to give more support, um, consider students' intent and disability when meting out punishments. A lot of times what was happening is students with disabilities or students who had discipline issues were sent over to these alternative education schools and once they were at these alternative education schools, if they did anything wrong, I mean, anything, minor disruption of class, walking out of class, chewing for a day or two, they were immediately like, this is your last stop, now you're kicked out. You're done, you're gone. So they were able to um, help pass new laws to overturn that. In 2011, there are, new, there are new state laws passed to restrict student ticketing for younger students. So the charts that we saw for 2010, 2011 have already gotten better. No student under 12 can be ticketed anymore in the state or, I'm sorry, can be criminally prosecuted in adult court. In 2013, we had two bills, SB 393 and 1114, that virtually eliminated the ability to ticket students at all, under 17, for school-related misbehavior. And in 2013, due to all this, we saw a more than 50% drop in the number of Class C tickets issued to school children for minor misbehavior because of these legislations that were passed. Quick question. Yes. If they're not ticketed, could they be fined, or does one lead to the other? That's a good question. Usually they're ticketed, and then the fine comes with the punishment for that ticket. Yeah. I can't speak to individual school districts and how they've been going around it and handling it, so I don't know if they're doing fines without tickets. What, what are some other Class C 
misdemeanors that we can kind of relate to analogy of the, these behaviors that are ticketed. What else um, is a class C? I believe it's no registration in your car. Thank you. Well, well, I was going to defer I'll, I'll to the I'll, lawyer. I would need a registration in your car. Oh, oh litter. littering. Littering, outdated registration on your car. Is cursing in public still a class C misdemeanor? I, I don't know. Okay. Right. I was told that at one time it might have been to scare me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. When, I hear a voice. When, okay. me, uh, again, uh, when the kids that get out of the alternative school, they go to juvenile delinquent places or, or jail, yeah. so to speak, for kids, or what happens? They could end up just going home, or they could go to juvenile justice centers or you know, boot camps and things like that. Basically, the school district has washed their hands of them. Um, so again, current efforts to dismantle it in Texas. Texas Appleseed is also still fighting this battle. They filed a complaint with the Department of Justice in 2013, specifically alleging Dallas County their truancy courts denied students due process. There were students that were going, now Dallas County had their own <coughs> truancy courts set up. They were sending so many students through this. And a lot of times these students were not being allowed to have attorneys present. Basically their due process was not happening. So they uh, filed that complaint and the Justice Department did open a civil investigation into that in March of this year. And some practices, just as an aside, did start quietly going away. So that story of the students being let out in handcuffs, some people haven't seen that as much anymore, even though you won't find an email on it or, you know, someone saying, hey, don't do this anymore. It just kind of quietly, don't put handcuffs on them. Um, and also they filed an administrative complaint with TEA stating that school districts are using um, truancy courts to force students of disability out of school instead of providing services for them. So, the big one. I don't know if you can read this or not. I'm gonna read it because this is a lot of information. It's really, really important, and this is what happened this year due to advocacy by Texas Appleseed, the NAACP, and other groups. And this is why it is so important for us to speak up. Um, in the 84th legislative session that just ended in 2015, signed by Governor Abbott, because as an aside, the same legislation was up in 2013, but Governor Perry vetoed it. So this year it passed. It goes into effect September 1st in the 2015-2016 school year. Thank you. And basically it's the decriminalization of truancy in Texas. That is a wonderful thing. Because as you can see with all the previous slides, that was a direct route to the pipeline to, to prisons. Now I can't see. <laughs> so, you know what? Here we go. Oh. Look at this. Okay. Ooh. That's what we need to do. There. Much better. Hey, there we go. Technical support. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what this bill does is it requires school districts to use truancy prevention measures. And actually, while you're reading it, I can look this way because that's a lot of information. It basically tells them that you have to do better. School districts, you have to support these students. You have to do things such as uh, get to feed, providing counseling for these students. All right. Employment of case managers, providing prevention and intervention services, creating behavior improvement plans for durations of no longer than 45 school days, assigning school-based community service. Those are things that the school districts can do to help these students before they get to that point. Now, if they do get to that point, if they are still chronically truant, the referral to court is a last ditch effort. And then the referral is made to a civil truancy court. They are no longer going to be sent to criminal court for truancy. That's a huge win. Um, school districts must document the preventative measures even before they get to that point. So they can't just say, oh, you've been truant for three days, you're going you know, to this court. They have to document that they did everything up here before they do this. Okay? <clears throat> Attendance officers can no longer take students into custody. So the lines of students going from the school to the van is not going to happen anymore. Current truancy charges that are prior to September 1st can be dismissed. 
and those records can be expunged. Okay, it's not an automatic. So if there's anyone that you know that have gone through that, they definitely need to speak up for themselves. And also, parents can still be subject to having complaints filed in county court or municipal court, but again, civil court um, with this legislation. All right. So what can we do next? That that's a great thing, but the fight is not over. We can continue to speak out on the three main causes and the other causes of the school to prison pipeline, which again, to review, zero tolerance policies, law enforcement officers in schools and hostile school climates, and racial disparities in disciplinary practices. You can contact your local and state leaders, let them know how you feel about this, see how they voted on the Senate bill that just passed, and either say thank you or why did you vote against or what possible reason can you have? I'm watching you now. That's you know very important for them to know. I don't agree with the way you voted on this. I am now watching you and you will now hear from me. And also you can donate to organizations such as the ACLU, Texas Appleseed that work on behalf of students and parents caught into these cycles. And know the laws for yourself so that you can advocate for yourself, your family, and your community. Okay. Um, I will, there are links that I've listed on here, and I know everybody's not going to like scribble real fast. I'll put my information up here, which is right here. If you email me at bmusings at gmail.com, I will immediately send you back a copy of this whole PowerPoint if you like, so that you can have the links and you can have um, the research and information. I think we could also thank oh, Senator John Whitmire, wouldn't he, the leader for yes. getting most of this passed? Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, we can post all the links that whatever you want to post on the uh, Awesome. So that's my time. Are there any questions? Yes. I have a couple of questions. I'm curious if you could give us a ballpark figure of the membership of Black Freethinkers, the organization that you're a part of. Houston Black Nonbelievers? Yes. Don, do you have a ballpark? <laughs> if I don't know something, I know who to go to. Um, do you have a ballpark figure for our membership? Actually, I should know that. I'm sure there is. Don't tag yourself. It's about 40. We have about 40 official members. We have a paid membership of $10. And uh, we have about 180 on our meetup page. And I'm also disturbed to think that a, young, a, a female defending herself against sexual assault could be charged as a criminal. I can't believe that ACLU, if that's happened more than once, if that, if the ACLU has not gone to court to remedy such a hideous error. Right. It's, it's now being looked at, but it happens. I mean, it happens a lot. And especially also um, the children that are caught in the, um, the sex trade, basically. Um, sex slaves, things like that, the children that are in that, a lot of times they are arrested for prostitution and their children, and they have been caught in the system. So that, again, that's why we talk about it, to bring it up so that you can be outraged, so that you can go and now speak about it and do something and support the people who are trying to do something about it. Yes? Are you, are you aware of the guy that runs that, uh, the Bob Sandborn, he, uh, Children at Risk? He works a lot with the uh, with the uh, human trafficking thing, trying to put a stop to it. And uh, you know, he's got a show on KPFD comes on Monday afternoon from three to four o'clock. Thank you. And that's Bob Sanborn. Yeah. Bob Sanborn. Thank you. That's all. Yes, sir. Uh, would you speak about what substitutes you recommend uh, for this uh, punishment kind of punishment? Or so the children who want to learn are not distracted uh, by these uh, uh, distracting and deterring effects of uh, misbehavior in the public in the classroom. When I went to school in the 20s and 30s, I'm pretty old. You know, this was not. I never heard of anything like this. We sat there and we were quiet and we listened to the teacher. Something has happened since then. Uh, I did. I think it. Do you think that integration had anything to do with it? And, and, what do you, and what do you recommend to solve the problem? Well, I haven't gotten my, um, well, let me go back. That's a really big question. 
Definitely. Um, two things that I, and I doubt I'll answer your question because it, it is so big, but two things that I do want to recommend. One, a lot of this is perception. A lot of it is. As I mentioned, if you look at the actual numbers, especially the one about 1956 versus 2003, 2004, the teachers being assaulted and things like that, there wasn't a huge increase. We see a lot more now, and we hear about a lot more now, and so in our minds, things are terrible. They're awful. Our, our kids are horrible. And that's just, it's not necessarily the case. But then the other side of that is my recommendations, which I would definitely defer to people who have you know, studied this for years and years and years and years. But supporting a child before they get to that point is always going to be worth it as opposed to trying to punish them afterwards. And then criminalization, another thing, you know, you, you mentioned that you went to school earlier on. The criminalization of student behavior is new. New as in from the 1990s forward. A lot of times back, you know, whether it was integration or not, students were, they were children. They were seen as children. And they did, you know, well, Bobby climbed the tree and fell and broke his arm. Okay, he was just being a little Bobby, whatever. Now it's, oh my gosh, he's a delinquent. He's climbing a tree. You know, it's a lot of times we react to things that are normal in, in childhood as if it's a criminal, you know, precursor to something like that. That one slide where there were improvements. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, that one slide you have where there were improvements. Okay. Uh, is there money, state money, to back up, you know, the extra help with that? Uh, <laughs> we're in uh, Texas. Uh, <laughs> 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 and that's that's one of the um, the detractors of the bill. That's one of the things that they brought up that Texas, basically the state, was pushing back on this more responsibility to the school district without properly funding it. So that is one of the limitations of the bill, definitely. Um, I think a school, I think school districts have, especially, well, I worked inside Baron Klein, so, and I also did some, you know, textbook sales and things like that. So I touched most of the school districts between Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. They have a lot of money and a lot of revenue streams especially depending on what area they're in, if they're getting additional federal money and things like that. I went to a lot of districts that didn't know what to do with some of the extra money because it had to be spent in specific places per the law. So it's, it's interesting. They have the money, but sometimes they can't spend it in the right places. And some of the people you know, who weren't really drilled about the new law were not happy simply, simply because of the funds. They were like, okay, we have to do this, but where are we going to get the money? But a lot of times, counselors who are there now can kind of see these things beforehand. And if they started early enough, it doesn't become a bigger issue. But I suggested for one of the earlier slides about the 13 and 15 year old white males. You got to include a clip on Chris Rock. He was once in an elevator, and two white teens jumped in, and he jumped out. He said, Y'all aren't killing me. And he said, What kind of world will we live in where little white kids want to go to black school where it's safe? I have to look that one up. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've been a teacher, and in my experience, the children that are not interested in what's going on in class often can't see any link between what they're being taught and their own lives. And it seems to me that if the apprenticeship type program, if interest in apprenticeships grows, where they can be tied into programs which show them what skills they're going to need for a job and that might actually lead to an internship or a job, I think that that may help some of those kids if they're put into that kind of a program. And you're a teacher, so what do you think? Oh, I was going to say I agree. And also, when we saw that the 13 to 15 year olds were kind of I don't want to say the most problematic, the ones that are getting the most citations and things like that. When I taught high school, the ninth graders and 10th graders were the hardest to teach. By the time they got to 11th and 12th grade, they saw the end of the road. You know, it was kind of like, you're, you only have a couple years left. 
So there's all those things going on, and then they can't, it's, it's too far. It's three years away. It's four years away. So definitely kind of getting them started on something a little earlier may be, you know, something that can help. Let me ask Vic, how many more questions are we, how are we on time? Do another one. Two more. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to point out someone's been patient all the way the corner. They were there. I'm so sorry. just uh, made a, a complaint with TA about is that they were using the truancy courts to get students with disabilities out of school so basically they you know students with disabilities were you know maybe they were disruptive maybe they didn't feel as though they had the, the money or the personnel to you know give them proper services and so instead of finding a way to do it Oh, they were absent for five days, so then they would send them to truancy court, and then, you know, a lot of times, again, 80% were um, low socioeconomic status, so it, the ball kept rolling. They were out of the school, and then they didn't have to count them in their, in their grades and things like that. So that definitely happens, and that's definitely something that we're looking at. And, okay, I don't want to, who did I miss? <laughs> Yes, that is outside the scope of this particular <laughs> Now that, that actually opens up a whole, it, it was very difficult for me to focus on this because it, it's like Pandora's box. Every time you find one article on something, it's linked to five other things. So definitely the education that the students are receiving is something that needs to be looked at in depth as well. Are they being educated or not being educated? The short answer is it depends on where they are. Well, let's just do one more. Okay. Who hasn't spoken? Candace hasn't spoken. Daniel hasn't spoken. Amber hasn't spoken. I don't know. Let's try to get them quick. I'll be quick. In reference to how the black females were treated, I went to high school in 1997 and I graduated in 2000. Um, I was also sent to alternative school. What happened is, a uh, boyfriend and I were having a, an argument. I pretty much called him a name. He pushed me. Now, he was close to six feet. Now, I'm a whopping five feet. But at that time, I was probably like, four, eight, four, ten, or whatever. Um, I called him a couple of names. He came over, he pushed me in. I literally flew across the concrete. So, we go to the principal's office. Guess who goes to alternative school? Me, because everything was my fault. And even after that, um, I noticed that other women that I knew, little girls at the time, that I knew from other schools, including mine, it was always the same thing. And also as a minority female, at the school, 
schools that I was at, the black population was less than 1%. And we were constantly harassed on a daily basis. And the other thing that's ironic is that the person who sent me to alternative school was a black assistant principal. So I was seen as being unruly. I was never a problem child, ever. I was an athlete. I was doing very well. Um, I never had any issues with teachers, any other students, but I went to alternative school. I just want to share that. Thank you. And there are thousands of those stories. Thousands. Daniel and then Amber. And then the gentleman in the orange shirt. And that's it. <laughs> so um, I, I just want to know, you're saying that they're being, the, ch the child, as low as nine years old, is being issued a citation that they had to deal with. They were. All right. So uh, what level of involvement do the parents have in terms of going to like this uh, court and system that they set up? For, for what's, what's the parents' role? The parent is there every step of the way. If a night now, thankfully now, as of 2013, nine-year-olds are not being ticketed. Uh, pretty much no one under 17 is being ticketed unless they're, you know, fighting or having a weapon or something like that. Um, but at this time, the parents had to go with the students. They had to, you know, especially nine to 11-year-olds, they don't have any money. They had to get a lawyer. They had to pay the fine. If they didn't, the parents could, you know, be ticketed directly. And they would have to pay the fine as well. Amber? Um, I just wanted to ask how um, slavery kind of turned into prison and stereotyping African Americans as troublemakers when they're not. Do you think this is a carryover from that? The short answer, yes. Um, there are books such as The Half That Has... I always say it wrong because I want to switch it in my head. The half has never been told. It talks about that. And then there was a documentary that we watched in HBN. Um, it was basically about, no, it was about reconstruction from how basically slavery turned into. Slavery the, by another name. Thank you. Slavery by another name. And it basically talks about how after slavery ended, there was a small period of reconstruction where, you know, things were hopefully getting better, that's a way overstatement. Um, but then after that, basically, it switched from, okay, if we can't enslave you, then we're going to put you all in prison, and then there's uh, peonage uh, servitude, basically, in jails. So it, it it's all related. Yes. It's, like it's, it's getting better, better. now that we're hearing more about it, it's because we're starting to, to have to adjust to change here. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm kind of cynical. Yes, you're... <laughs> Last question. The, the two common ways out of poverty are for, for school aged child is military or college. If somebody has a criminal record, they can't get in the military. Even a, even a juvenile criminal record. What about for college? How does that affect? Well, I, for the scope of this, I didn't look at college versus military, but I can probably assume that if you're you know, you're already in low socioeconomic status. You're getting tickets, you're getting fined, you're getting, you know, you're going to juvenile jail for truancy and things like that. How are you gonna find time to get into college? Now, if it if it precludes it or bars it, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are schools where, you know, you can still get into college um, if you have a, a juvenile record, but um, just practically speaking. One way it affects you is you can't get a student loan. I know that you have a criminal record. That's one way to affect you. You may still go to college, but you're like getting your yourself. That's not true. I mean, there are some effects on you uh, as far as criminal activity that you can't get a scholarship for or grants you something like that for the federal government. It does not exclude you from all of them. So it depends on the effects. You can't get a student loan. We're for, drug charges. Charges. Okay. Okay. for drug charges, you can't get sued. All right. Thank you, guys. Right.